Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. J. Michael Bailey. He is a psychologist, behavioral geneticist, and professor at Northwestern University. His interests include sexual orientation, gender nonconformity, sexual arousal, behavioral genetics, and evolutionary psychology, and we're going to talk about all that today. So, Dr. Bailey, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I admire your project very much. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, okay, so let's start with sexual orientation. So what is sexual orientation and do we know how many kinds of sexual orientation are out there? Okay, uh, so that's actually a, a bigger question uh, than it might first appear, but I, I'll, I'll say that uh, sexual orientation, as I've typically studied it, is uh, one's degree of sexual attraction to uh, men, adult men versus adult women. That's the most common understanding of the term uh, sexual orientation. Uh, however, in recent years, uh, we've begun to consider expanding that uh, understanding to other kinds of dimensions. For example, uh, attraction to adults versus children. So uh, there's a very uh, controversial question regarding whether pedophilia is a sexual orientation. Uh, and uh, we can get back to it. I, I think that uh, that is a defensible position. Uh, however, uh, I think that uh, we should be very careful to talk about which sense of sexual orientation uh, we mean. And, and uh, unless I say anything else, I'm going to be uh, meaning the uh, conventional understanding, which is degree of uh, sexual attraction to men, women, or both. So uh, an, another uh, quick point I'll make is that uh, sexual orientation uh, has to do with our internal feelings, uh, and it is distinct from, for example, sexual identity, which is uh, what uh, I tell you I am, or perhaps what I internally think of myself as. Uh, and uh, there's lots of uh, historical examples of people whose external sexual identities uh, don't match uh, uh, their internal feelings. Uh, people have uh, come out, for example, uh, as uh, having a homosexual orientation after years in which they were heterosexually married and insisted that they were heterosexual. They had a heterosexual identity throughout that time, but uh, I think that their sexual orientation probably was always uh, homosexual. Uh, so I'll pause there. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you mentioned the fact that perhaps people have a sexual orientation identity, or that is, they identify, for example, as heterosexual or homosexual, bisexual, and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, they also have a sexual orientation that, would you say that that's fixed or not? Um, so uh, it is time to distinguish uh, men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that sexual orientation uh, is expressed differently in men and women. Uh, it may uh, have different origins. And uh, my uh, opinion is that in men, sexual orientation is fixed. Um, and I, I suppose uh, the, the most persuasive evidence to me consists of a few case reports of uh, newborn boys or recently born boys whose uh, genitals uh, were either congenitally malformed or 
there was a surgical accident leading to the decision, the medical decision to uh, raise them as girls. Uh, and this was a thing back, you know, uh, 20 to 40 years ago mm -hmm. uh, or, or even longer. Uh, and I don't think that's done anymore. But when it was done, uh, it allowed uh, the examination of the extent to which what sex you're raised should affect your sexual orientation. And, and remember, if we're thinking about um, changing somebody's sexual orientation, what manipulation could possibly be stronger than taking a natal male cutting off his penis, uh, changing his genitals into female genitals, and uh, raising him as a girl from early childhood. Right. Well, these, uh, these uh, natal males, they were born male, uh, were followed up into adulthood, and in every case, they were sexually attracted to women. And I think maybe one of them said they were also attracted to men, but mostly not. Uh, so I, th I believe that is the strongest possible, plausible uh, social manipulation, and it didn't work. Uh, if you can't change a, a male's sexual orientation by changing him into a girl, bring him as a girl, how likely is it that male sexual orientation is malleable? I, I think it's really not. Now, uh, there is no scientific evidence that is analogous to that for natal females, girls and women. Uh, and that's, it, it's just, um, it just doesn't exist. Uh, furthermore, uh, there is evidence that female sexual orientation is more prone to change. Uh, it's, it's a not uncommon story that women uh, are heterosexual, they're, they're married, they're happily married, uh, they, maybe they get divorced, they meet somebody, they meet a woman who they fall in love with and spend the rest of their lives with. Um, or, you know, some women change back and forth uh, in terms of their uh, uh, self-reported sexual attraction patterns. Uh, and so on. Um, a, 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 a further complication of the sex difference is that there is a, a very direct and persuasive way to study male sexual orientation uh, that doesn't really translate to women as well, or at, le at least it doesn't work for women as well. Or to the extent it works, it gives different answers. Uh, and that is uh, studying uh, sexual arousal patterns. Uh, what sexually arouses you? Uh, most people, uh, most, let's start with men. Most men, if they see an, a, a picture, or better yet, a video of a very attractive person of their preferred sex, so heterosexual men looking at women, homosexual men looking at men, they experience uh, some sexual arousal. And uh, we can measure this in the laboratory uh, by looking at their uh, penile erections. Uh, and this is a very good way of uh, assessing sexual orientation for men, uh, and uh, by and large, I mean, very, very accurately, heterosexual men get erections to uh, female stimuli, but not to male stimuli. Mm -hmm. Homosexual men show the opposite pattern. Uh, and furthermore, if uh, a man comes to our lab and says he's heterosexual, and yet he uh, gets strong erections to male stimuli uh, and less to female stimuli, uh, I'm likely to disbelieve his claims of being heterosexual and, and have had confirmation 
in some cases like that. Uh, women are completely different. We can measure genital arousal in women using uh, uh, a uh, device that measures blood flow to their vagina. Um, lesbians do show uh, somewhat more genital arousal to female stimuli than to male stimuli. However, heterosexual women are genitally indifferent. That is, they show on average exactly as much uh, sexual arousal to uh, male stimuli as to female stimuli. Very different than men. And uh, I believe that this sex difference probably contributes to uh, women's uh, flexibility over the lifespan, women's ability to become attracted to both men and women. Uh, that doesn't really uh, occur for most men. Right. Uh, so uh, I think that perhaps uh, the sources you've referenced, the sources of evidence you referenced, already give some support to this claim. But would you say that sexual orientation is inborn? So again, uh, I believe that sexual orientation is inborn for males. Mm -hmm. uh, I am less certain for females, um, in part because I'm less sure what sexual orientation is for females. Uh, there's also, um, you know, evidence that, uh, uh, well, I, I've already mentioned uh, uh, the evidence that female uh, sexuality can uh, change over the lifespan. Um, so uh, I, I suspect uh, sexual orientation is less inborn for women, but um, there's, there's not great consensus on this question. Right. And is there any good evidence to support any environmental influences on sexual orientation? The best evidence, well, okay, first of all, uh, studies of twins, including identical twins, uh, shows unequivocally that um, identical twin pairs can differ in their uh, sexual orientation. By the way, this is usually uh, assessed in twin studies using self-report questionnaires rather than lab studies. But, you know, I, I, I believe them for the most part. And there actually has been a recent study by Gerolf Rieger in the UK, uh, where he actually brought uh, twins to his lab and assessed their uh, genital arousal patterns and it supported their self-reports. Um, so if identical twins can have different sexual orientation, that proves that there must be environmental influences on sexual orientation. Uh, the question is, what are those environmental influences? And uh, certainly for males, uh, and, and probably in large part for females too, uh, I believe that the environmental factors are likely to be different than what most people uh, understand when they hear the word environment that most people probably think about what parents do, what uh, peers do, schools, socioeconomic factors, and so on. But there's also an environment uh, that uh, happens before birth. And this environment can be uh, very powerful. And that is the environment that I think is likely to be most influential for sexual orientation especially male sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Do we have good data on the rates of homosexuality and bisexuality across societies? So it's, it's very difficult to get a good rate for these kinds of questions 
uh, because um, in most societies, people consider this pretty private matter. Uh, it's uh, still stigmatized somewhat even uh, in the West, uh, yeah. North America and Western Europe. Uh, um, nevertheless, we have made a lot of progress in the past, um, you know, uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, the tragic AIDS epidemic uh, helped the progress and that scientists uh, decided that it was important to get estimates of the prevalence of homosexuality. Uh, and there has been, uh, I, I think, you know, a fairly reasonable ra narrow range of the prevalence of um, homosexuality, uh, at least in the West. And I would say, you know, that most estimates are down around um, one, two, three, four percent, somewhere around there. Now that that's a, you could say, well, that's a big range from one to four percent. Yeah, it is. Uh, but um, now in non-Western cultures, uh, it's our estimates are less good. Uh, however, I don't think it's plausible that in, in any of these cultures, it's much higher than that. And I also don't know of any uh, existing cultures in which uh, homosexuality is absent. Mm -hmm. Do we know if there are any specific areas of the brain? Perhaps I wouldn't say that they determine because that might be too strong a word to use here, but that go associated with sexual orientation. So we, we don't know, but we have um, our strong suspicions and uh, based on uh, some other uh, mammalian species and actually some uh, bird species in which um, very careful laboratory work can be done uh, to manipulate uh, the uh, something akin to sexual orientation, not exactly like it. So for example, in rats, uh, you can change the um, the uh, what male rats typically do is to mount anything they can, and mm -hmm. female rats uh, lower dose. That is, they raise their rear ends uh, so that male rats could mount them when they're in the mood. Uh, you can change what male rats do. You can change them from mounters to lower dosers by the right kinds of uh, early uh, man hormonal manipulations and vice versa. Uh, and this appears to depend uh, pretty strongly on an area uh, of the hypothalamus, which is part of the uh, limbic system. And uh, there's also evidence in uh, rams, uh, male sheep, uh, who mount other male rams, that their uh, hypothalamus is unusual. There was in 1991, a very famous study by uh, the neuroscientist Simon LeVay uh, that uh, showed that um, <clears throat> uh, gay men who had died of AIDS had uh, a particular nucleus in the hypothalamus that was smaller than uh, heterosexual men who had died of uh, AIDS or, or other uh, causes. And it was similar in size of uh, uh, presumptively heterosexual women. Um, I think that was a very important study. And uh, I, I think that it's still uh, a viable finding. However, uh, there have been follow-up studies that found a weaker effect than LeVay found. And, you know, we're, we're glad that uh, the specimens are no longer common. That is, uh, death from AIDS is much less common uh, where these studies are done. That's well worth 
the slowing down of scientific progress, but it has slowed down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. You need you need aut- autopsy autopsyable brains to do this. Right. So you've already mentioned twin studies here. Have we already been able to identify any genes associated with sexual orientation? Um, so um, I am uh, an old-fashioned kind of behavior geneticist. I study uh, twins and relatives and so on. I do uh, follow the uh, newer molecular genetics literature, but um, uh, I am not uh, an expert on that. And uh, I think it was like two years ago, uh, Gena et al. published uh, a paper in Science that used molecular genetics techniques on a huge sample uh, of uh, people from, I think it was UK, uh, and they did find uh, evidence for, uh, you know, I, I don't want to misspeak, but they, they certainly found evidence that there were uh, um, genetic influences on uh, both male and female sexual orientation um, using uh, molecular genetics techniques. Now, whether they identified particular alleles, uh, I believe they did not many, but I, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to misspeak, so I'll stop. Okay, fair enough. Uh, could you tell us about the fraternal birth order effect? I mean, what it is and if it is scientifically solid? Yeah, the fraternal birth order effect, I think, is uh, very important, and I, I want to just uh, acknowledge the person who's done uh, the lion's share of the work here. That is uh, Ray Blanchard uh, from Toronto. Uh, and um, th- the effect is this. For male sexual orientation, homosexual men tend to have more older brothers, that is, a greater number of older brothers compared with heterosexual men. It seems as if having older brothers increases the likelihood that a male will become homosexual or be be born uh, a future homosexual, I guess is the best way. Uh, Ray Blanchard uh, has this very interesting theory that this has to do with um, a mother's immune response to uh, the uh, proteins in male fetuses that makes her uh, produce antibodies that affects the brain development of the uh, male fetuses. I think that, you know, I think that's actually a brilliant theory, and I hope it's true, uh, and there is some evidence for it, but that is, I think, much less established than the fact that there is a fraternal birth order effect, just the numbers. Now, uh, I, I believe that that finding, the fraternal birth order effect, that is that uh, homosexual men have more older brothers compared with heterosexual men. I I think that is quite solid. Uh, Blanchard has uh, uh, been accumulating many samples uh, by now. Uh, I am aware there's a recent uh, paper uh, that uh, appears to be under review, or it's been posted, uh, challenging the fraternal birth order effect. And it's it's a difficult paper. I have uh, tried to read it and... uh, uh, I, insofar as I understand it, uh, I am not convinced that it's time to get rid of the fraternal birth order effect. Uh, but there are uh, scientists, I guess, who are challenging it, and it's always good uh, to have debate, uh, and we'll see. But um, I still think the fraternal birth order effect is solid. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. So when we were talking about sexual orientation, we ended up getting into sexual arousal as well. So some of the questions I had here about that are already answered. But uh, just one more. What is masculinity, femininity in the context of sexual arousal? So uh, I believe you may, your question may be motivated by a paper that I was a co-author on, but not the first author, Gerolf Rieger uh, looked at the relationship between um, masculinity, femininity, and sexual arousal patterns mm -hmm. uh, in men and women. And uh, so masculinity, femininity, when we talk, when we talk about um, sexual orientation, we're talking about um, the dimension of uh, I often call gender nonconformity. Uh, gender nonconformity is correlated with um, homosexual orientation. Uh, gay men and lesbians uh, tend to be uh, to exhibit some cross-sex behaviors, especially during childhood. Uh, gay men often uh, were disliked you know, competitive, rough sports, and, and some of them even like playing with dolls and, and playing with girls and so on. On average, that's a, that's a big effect. And lesbians showed the uh, opposite pattern on average. So that paper uh, was looking at whether, um, for example, among lesbians, the most masculine lesbians produce the most masculine sexual arousal patterns. Well, what is a masculine sexual arousal pattern? A masculine sexual arousal pattern is a specific sexual arousal pattern because males show very specific sexual arousal patterns. As I said before, straight men get much more sexual arousal to female than to male stimuli or persons, and gay men show the opposite pattern. Uh, so Gerolf was uh, interested in whether uh, it would be the most masculine lesbians who were the most specific in their sexual arousal pattern. And in that paper, uh, we did not find that pattern uh, for lesbians. Mm -hmm. So talking about gender nonconformity, is it something that occurs more frequently in homosexual uh, men in comparison to heterosexual men? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, gender nonconformity can be uh, measured in various ways, and we and so and this question has been studied in various ways, and it's and it's very consistent. Uh, I suppose the most common way has been to ask adults, uh, what were you like as children? Uh, and uh, you get big differences between heterosexual and homosexual adults, both men and women, in their memories of what they were like as children with um, homosexual persons uh, saying that they were more gender nonconforming, uh, that uh, effect size uh, is uh, over a standard deviation, which is large. Um, this has also been studied, uh, though less often, by identifying very gender nonconforming children, little boys, five-year-old boys, say, who are cross-dressing as girls, some of whom say, I want to be a girl or I am a girl, and following them up into adulthood. Uh, and uh, little boys like that are much more likely to be homosexual compared with typical boys. Uh, the follow-up studies suggest that at least 70% uh, of them uh, are homosexual against a base rate of, say, 4% tops. So, uh, and uh, same is true for females, although uh, 
only a minority of extreme tomboys or girls with gender identity disorder uh, grow up to be lesbians, but still much more than say the 2% we would expect based on base rates. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, gender nonconformity does not end w when people uh, go through adolescence or become adults. There are ways in which adults can be gender nonconforming. Uh, one of the best studied ways is in terms of their occupational and recreational interests. Um, you know, so for example, a, a relatively masculine occupation is a truck driver or a computer scientist seems to be a, a, an interest that uh, males are much more likely to hold than females. Uh, and uh, f more feminine interests include things like being a, a hairdresser, being a dancer. Uh, and when you give these uh, interest inventories to adults, you get big differences between heterosexual and homosexual adults. Um, you, there are even there are also differences in things like um, motor behavior, movement. You know, there are stereotypes about um, how gay men move and how lesbians move. There's something to those stereotypes. You can tell better than chance just by watching somebody move uh, by the way people uh, present themselves. This is a better sign for women, uh, lesbians, or for example, especially likely to cut their hair short. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a tell. Uh, there's also something that's very, very interesting, and that is um, uh, patterns of speech. There is uh, uh, something I call a gay accent. So uh, uh, comedians in the US, uh, many of them know how to, uh, if they want to be a gay character, they can speak in a certain way. It's very clear what they're trying to do. And uh, studies uh, conducted in my lab and other labs have shown that stereotype is true. Uh, and uh, people are starting to study that uh, cross-culturally, which I think is a very interesting and valuable uh, uh, you know, contribution. Does it, does it happen in non-English speaking languages as, as well? I would bet it does, but we need the data. Right. What do we know hourly in life children develop their gender identity? So I have a <clears throat> I have a picture uh, that was shared by uh, a leading researcher on gender identity of a little boy who is uh, almost one year old. He's not yet one year old. Who is um, what's notable about this picture is that he is trying to put on his mother's high heeled shoes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took this picture because for weeks he'd had this fascination with his mother's shoes. Uh, and when this boy grew up, when he got older, uh, his, um, he wanted to be a girl uh, later in childhood. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, uh, he's a gay man. Uh, so Assuming that that uh, fascination with his mother's shoes was not just a coincidence, and I think it wasn't, that kid was showing signs of his gender identity by the age of one. Now, I think that stories like that, that's, that's not the only story like that I've ever heard, although usually uh, the, uh, the age at which people noticed was somewhat older than that, but it's usually early to mid childhood. 
you know, three, four, five, mm -hmm. six. So uh, talking about transsexuality, is it also a kind of gender identity or not? Um, so transsexualism, uh, it's, it's, we're in an, another area where it's important to be very specific about what mm -hmm. we mean. Right. And uh, when I use uh, the term transsexual, all I mean is somebody who uh, wants to or has changed their sex. Um, there is more than one kind of transsexualism. Uh, and they are completely distinct from each other, and you can't use evidence from one type to uh, draw conclusions about evidence from another type. Uh, so one type of transsexualism uh, I would call uh, child onset type, and this, this is the, the kind that we've probably uh, been talking about or near so far. These are uh, persons who early in childhood were very gender nonconforming, probably gender dysphoric, that is, they were unhappy with their natal sex. And they stayed that way. And as adults, they still desire, or they desire to change sex, or they change sex. That is, uh, I think, most people's initial association when we use the word transsexual, and it exists. Um, a second type occurs only in natal males, not in natal females. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, I call it autogynephilic transsexualism. Uh, and this transsexualism is motivated by an unusual sexual interest in some males, which is uh, sexual arousal at the idea of being a woman and particularly having the body of a woman. I, I, a small number of males uh, in adolescent, they find out that it really turns them on to uh, cross-dress as a woman. Uh, commonly they do this in private, uh, look at themselves in the mirror, become very aroused, uh, and uh, this is called uh, autogynephilia, auto-self, mm -hmm. gyna, feel, uh, female, yeah. philia, love of. Uh, a subset of males with autogynephilia, uh, they realize that their sexual arousal is not just about cross-dressing, but it is about fantasizing that they have uh, female bodies mm -hmm. uh, and live as females. And this is, of course, possible. Uh, it is not, so uh, most people, uh, autogynephilia is a weird idea. Uh, but in the West, autogynephilia is the most common reason why uh, males get sex changes. Hmm. It has been that way for decades. And uh, the reason why most people don't know about it is, I, I think there are a couple of related reasons. One is um, it's a sexual, sexually motivated phenomenon and people are uncomfortable about sex. Yeah. Uh, and the other reason is that uh, some autogynephilic males uh, dislike this idea. Uh, I mean, in part because they don't want other people to think about them as having an unusual sexual interest. But it's also because um, s many of them have such a strong desire to be like women. And autogynephilia is by definition 
not like anything that women have. It's an unusual sexual interest in males. So I think you haven't touched on homosexual transsexuals. Uh, so I have touched on homosexual transsexuals. I just called them something else. I oh, called okay. them child child onset transsexuals. But uh, Ray Blanchard, again, uh, I mentioned him under the fraternal birth order effect, but mm -hmm. uh, it is his work that uh, has led to this uh, distinction among natal males between autogynophilic transsexualism and what I called child onset transsexualism. Mm -hmm. But uh, he called uh, homosexual transsexualism, which I'm fine with as well. And that is because uh, all of these males who were extremely gender nonconforming children, they were very feminine boys, very feminine. And they grew up and changed into women. They are all sexually attracted to men, which is consistent, uh, which is homosexual with respect to their birth sex. So they are NATO males grow up to be attracted to men. So they are in that sense, homosexual. Some people object to that terminology because they, they say, well, they're women now. Okay, but you know, it, it's hard to talk about uh, this, these phenomena precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but since we we're focusing so much on males, is it because transsexualism is more common among men than women? Um, the how common transsexualism is uh, varies somewhat uh, across cultures. Mm -hmm. um, the transsexual the phenomenon is. Um, is not necessarily uh, fixed. It depends on, so whether somebody with, uh, who, who's a, say a very feminine male, mm -hmm. uh, is going to grow up and get a sex change, depends on a lot of things other than what that boy is like. It depends on the costs and benefits yeah. uh, and the traditions in his society. Sure. Uh, and the same uh, for female. Uh, so in the West, in the United States and Western Europe, uh, uh, it has been more common for males to change their sex. That is, people born male have be become trans women more often than uh, people born female have changed into men. Mm -hmm. However, there that may be changing. There, during the past year, uh, decade, past decade, there has been an epidemic of gender dysphoria among natal females. This usually happens starting in adolescence when out of the blue, an adolescent girl will tell her parents, you know, I'm trans. Um, this is uh, very striking and a very controversial uh, phenomenon that has been called rapid onset gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. The uh, researcher Lisa Littman is the person who came up with that term. and. Uh, she believes, and, and I think she has reason to believe, that this is largely uh, driven by uh, social contagion in which uh, vulnerable adolescent girls uh, attribute uh, their problems uh, to the idea, which is incorrect, that they have classic gender dysphoria. Uh, so this is a, a, a totally new kind of gender dysphoria, and we don't, and, and some of these girls are changing into men. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're getting testosterone, they're getting mastectomies, and so on. But this is such a new phenomenon. Like I say, it's really only shown up 
the past decade, we don't really know the most likely outcome for these cases. Right. So uh, another question, and I hope I pronounce this term correctly. What are gynandromorphophilic men? So gynandromorphophilia. So, uh, yeah. So gynandromorph, uh, if you parse that word, uh, it means um, somebody who changes from one sex to the other. And uh, gynandromorphophilia has been mostly studied in natal males. And uh, these are uh, men who are attracted to, uh, so I have to give you a trigger warning. Uh, I'm going to say a word that some people object to. I think that they're being silly when they object to this, uh, uh, but you may get some complaints. Uh, th these are men who are attracted to she-males. A she-male is uh, a trans woman. So this is a person who's born male, mm -hmm. who is in the process of changing to female. She will, uh, in, in uh, she-male pornography, she will have uh, uh, female breasts that were uh, made surgically, but uh, she is still retained her penis. So this is a person with both breasts and a penis. And that kind of uh, pornography is actually pretty common, uh, suggesting that uh, a lot of uh, people are interested in it. Uh, like most pornography, uh, men are more interested than women. And um, there is uh, there are men who have this as their primary sexual interest, and we call them gynandromorphophiles. In short, mm -hmm. I will say GAMP, G-A-M-P. GAMP is easier to say than gynandromorphophiles. Okay, that's very interesting. So uh, I have one last question. And by, by the way, I, I, I will say that um, yeah. uh, GAMPs, uh, we have studied them in my laboratory uh, using our sexual arousal uh, method and they are very similar uh, in the sexual arousal patterns that they produce to straight men. They are they're more like much more like straight men than gay men. They're they're heterosexual, not homosexual. Okay. Even though they are attracted to a person with a penis, but also breasts. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, would this constitute another category of sexual orientation or not? Uh, uh, it's a good question, and I'm not sure. <laughs> they, they, so they do have this uh, preference. And in the lab, you know, we also showed them uh, stimuli uh, featuring gynandromorphs, she males. Uh, uh, and they get more aroused by those than they get aroused to uh, just plain old women mm. and much more than they get aroused to plain old men. So uh, it depends on our uh, understanding of sexual orientation. And uh, I'm, I'm less sure with these people than I am with uh, just typical heterosexual and homosexual men. Okay. So I have one last question, and this is more of a general one. We've talked several times during our conversation about behavior genetics, but you also do some work in evolutionary psychology. So I would like to ask you, how do you square off genetically based individual differences with the idea coming from evolutionary psychology of species-wide uh, psychological adaptations. Yeah, I, I think that's a really uh, interesting question. Uh, again, uh, you know, to the extent that um, a behavior is an adaptation, 
why doesn't everybody have behave this the same? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously they don't. Uh, and I think that there are several uh, interesting theories out there, and I think these different theories ap apply to different variations. Uh, so the most um, relevant to what we've been talking about, sexual orientation, you know, what, why do, why does anybody have a homosexual orientation? I mean, you know, heterosexual orientation is an adaptation. You know, the, the uh, men strongly getting sexually aroused by attractive females, that clearly facilitates these men going out and trying to mate with those women. That's what makes babies. That's the currency of evolution. Yeah. What's what's with men seeing other attractive men getting sexually aroused and trying to mate with them? That doesn't produce babies. And um, I have a very strong opinion on this, and that is that we have no idea <laughs> why homosexuality persists evolutionarily. It's a fascinating question that we don't understand the answer to yet. It's it's a it's it's a huge mystery. And even though homosexuality is uh, you know it's not nearly as common as heterosexuality, let's say it's let's say it's the lowest plausible uh, rate, one percent. One percent is still way higher than we would expect given how infrequently homosexual men reproduce compared with heterosexual men. It's a huge mystery. So uh, then we have some other phenomena like, you know, um, I don't know, like criminality mm -hmm. uh, or, or psychopathy. Uh, there have been some really interesting theories that uh, these are regulated by frequency dependent selection. That is, uh, if being a psychopath, which you mean mistreating other people for your own benefit, <laughs> uh, uh, if that is rare enough, then that might be a fine evolutionary strategy. You know, you can get things from other people uh, uh, rather easily, uh, but once it becomes uh, more common, then other people are going to start watching out for people like you, and it will become much less, uh, it will have less of a payoff. Um, so that's that's a plausible mechanism for that. Uh, some uh, individual differences may not make that much of a difference with respect to fertility, like how, um, I don't know, let's say how uh, open to experience versus closed to new experiences one is. Maybe it just doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of how many offspring you leave. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, I've, I've always been very interested in uh, this uh, domain of uh, questions, but uh, I have not uh, contributed that many, any answers. I've contributed questions more than answers. Well, fair enough. OK, so where can people find your work on the Internet? I would. Uh, uh, encourage people who are sufficiently interested to look two places. Uh, one would be uh, my ResearchGate page, uh, and if they have an account, they can go in there and they can download a bunch of my stuff. Uh, and or if it's if they they can't find it, email me and I'll I'll send it to them. And the other uh, is Google Scholar. Um, those the two main places and I also I didn't mention it, but I, I did write write a book that discusses a lot of this evidence. This book was uh, is called uh, uh, The Man Who Would Be Queen mm -hmm. and it's about uh, femininity and males including transsexualism. It was published in 2003 right. 
there was a huge controversy about it uh, that you can read about, uh, but you can also uh, read my book for free, and I encourage you to uh, if you're interested in these uh, uh, issues. Okay, very well. I will be leaving links to that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Bailey, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure. Good to see you. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. Please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links for Patreon and PayPal in the description box. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lagurero, Francis Ford, and Frederick Sunde, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle. Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Kozup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Sandman Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguenzo, Michael Stormer, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cousin, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librant, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weida, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Pliz, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Back, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, my producers, Isar Webb, James Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Liz Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardus France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, and Sergio Codriano. Thank you for all.